say that uh, he received some of the highest marks on our rocket program. Um, so please take your seats. And then just a quick program change so that you're all not panicking in an hour. We're going to actually take our break, our afternoon break after Lauren's session as we switch laptops back um, and get ready to prepare for Bonnie. So just so you know, after Lauren's session, we'll take our uh, afternoon break. So with no further ado, here's Heather from Boogie. Aloha, everyone. Um, I have the privilege of um, introducing you to a great mind in the hospitality digital marketing world, um, Mr. Lauren Gray. He is a CHDM. Uh, he is also an internationally recognized authority in the field of hospitality marketing. Um, he's an expert in year, uh, he's appeared as an expert yearly at numerous national industry conferences. Uh, spanning the hospitality and the digital marketing industry. He's spoken on topics at industry events across the U.S., Canada, the Caribbean, and Australia. Um, he's also contributed to the publications um, at the New York Times, USA Today, Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, and has articles published in numerous trade journals as well. In addition to participating to chairing on numerous industry boards and organizations, he is the past chair of the Digital Marketing Council for HSMAI. Um, HSMAI recognized Lauren as one of the top 25 extraordinary minds in sales and marketing, and he's currently serving on the Board of Americas um, for our international organization. Uh, without further ado, Lauren, we'd love to hear from you. <laughs> I need to call that down. It sounds like I could walk on water and serve bread and fish. Um, thank you very, very much. I have the dubious task of trying to explain the universe and give two examples in a very short period of time. Uh, to give you some history of this presentation, I always start the deck, this, uh, well, I have the same deck, and I always start it a thousand different ways. Every presentation is different. It depends on what rabbit holes we go down and what conversations we come out of all this. I have yet to successfully finish my presentation. Um, ever. <laughs> it's 10 pounds in a 5 pound bag. Uh, mainly for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, some of the conversations from your inspiration, your conversations, your questions, and I will solicit feedback and insights from you all. Um, it's critical to us understanding this process of merging digital marketing and revenue management because that's really what we're discussing today is the usability of both disciplines. Uh, for those who I know that are in revenue management, uh, I do have bad news for you and that is your, uh, is your job exists right now. Uh, in the future, you will be out of it because your job as it exists right now will not be the one that carries in the long-term future. As is digital marketing for myself or anybody that does digital marketing, those jobs will also disappear. And, uh, and what's going to come out of that is really a combination, a hybrid of those two. And I say that for lots of reasons, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But what I'd like to go over and let you know is there's a challenge that I'm presenting. I mentioned it to a few as I was meeting and reading earlier this morning. But the challenge is this, and I'm asking you this legitimately because I'm asking if you get knocked off the top of the hill. I've challenged every one of our rocket presentations with give me your worst, your hardest revenue management problem you're currently having right now. And not great strategies, you can't talk great strategies on. Um, think about it, put it into a statement that we can work with. At the end of my presentation, I'm gonna to try to give as much time as possible which is the reason why I don't finish my presentation most of the time, so that we can go over and bring that project to light, and as a room collectively work on it, and if I can't give you either a solution or direction to a solution, you have three hours of my time to continue the conversation. Okay? Now, it may not mean too much, maybe I have to, and, the, and the secondary price is four hours of my time. Uh, <laughs> don't really put it, well, that sounds damn egotistical. Three hours of my time if you don't get it right. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so <clears throat> I've changed the certification name uh, to make a point with this. M is for marketing, because in all honesty, your revenue management has to involve marketing. And I say this because uh, Ideas is in the room. Jane, who works with Ideas, I mentioned to her one time that I said, revenue management is a lot like driving a car while looking through the rear view mirror. You have all of this historical data, you have all this knowledge of where you've been, and from that information, you're trying to determine where you want to go. Now, I borrowed and a really neat little video that I borrowed uh, that, from them uh, to describe this, or visually anyway. And the idea is that from all the data that you're working with, you're really trying to take historical relevance and apply it to future context. And from a marketing point of view, it's a little blurry on the side. 
Marketing is the inversion of your daily life. Marketing is all about the now and the forward. And we'll hopefully give some good examples as to why that would be a steady case. Now, I have a little video snippets. We'll play as many as we can before we start repeating our time. Uh, this one is talking about, I don't know if anybody's a sci-fi buff like I am, but anybody ever seen the movie The Minority Report? It's a few years old now, okay? And this is to visually give you a perspective of how I see what we're trying to do. And we'll discuss it after I get to the point of playing it, which is... For those who may not know, the young lady has the ability to see in the future. They're running for the police. Those are the police. They're in a mall, which won't be happening in another five years. But they're in a mall, and they're trying to get away from the police. He didn't understand why, and then at the right moment when the police all turned to look, bullets were in the way. What I'm asking is, what's written on the top? The right moment. What we do as revenue managers, what we do as digital marketers, is the axiom, right price, right person, right time. We are literally trying to predict when lightning is going to hit what point, where and how. <laughs> You're looking at it in reverse, digital marketing is looking forward, but together, we can actually make that right moment happen. Because she was seeing forward, and time has already passed, and you were able to determine the right moment. And that's why I wanted to make that video point, was because that's what we're doing every day. We're not just guessing, we're educatingly guessing, but we're guessing to a point of being able to predict a model. So, oops, I have to get over here. I want to try something. For all of us in the hospitality industry, this is a magic time. And I say that from being in the hospitality for many years, and for all of you that have been, pleasure of it as well. But this, and I'm not gonna read you, I hate people who read slides. Uh, you can read it faster than I can read it. Our paradigm is shifting. Now we like to blame age groups on this, saying, oh, young people, are not, they don't wanna buy a home or own a home, or whatever like this. But in real reality, everybody's paradigm is shifting. Everybody is thinking differently about what they want in life. And this point was simply made that we are what people want. We're providing what people find of the highest interest right now. And with the technologies we're going to talk a little bit about with digital marketing, you'll see why it's a great time to be here in the industry. All right, uh, a reverse of what we just told you earlier this morning, everyone has an iPhone, please take them out. And if you don't have an iPhone, you have an Android, hopefully somebody nearby you has an iPhone, you can look over the shoulder. Again, I'm not going to read this to you, if you please go through the process as described. Of course, those who have shut their location-based services off here are going to see the information I hope you see, but for those who haven't and have iPhones, please follow the process. And when you get to the bottom of the description and see what I hope you see, please raise your hand because I'd like you to share what it is you're looking at. Now, you'll notice that this little job here, this is a camera. We're recording the session so that you all know. I'll be giving you a link at the end. This presentation will be there, as long as other presentations I've done the same. Also, because I never do get to finish my presentation, the entire thing I did is a webinar. So you get to see the whole presentation. It was originally intended and built, and also all the links and all the information, plus a slide share deck of the slides. So other than your own personal notes, all of this will be available to you at the very end to look at as well, including the videos where we're going to look it up, which might be a few days, by the way, because after this is done, I'm enjoy being here for the first time. All right, anybody get to the bottom of this yet? Yes? Um, it's giving me the exact location, how many times I visited it since a certain date. Yep. And how long you were there? Um, I was there three days at certain times with the date range. Oh, wow. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Anybody else shocked by this? I mean, we know that they're tracking us, right? And this is just Apple. I mean, Android does it also. There's no base in this. If you shop your location-based services, your phone will be lesser for doing it, but there are other applications like Facebook who continue because you've given them that permission. Anybody read the terms and conditions of it? Facebook? They have the right to use anything whenever way they want to, for whatever purpose they want to, whenever they want to, but whatever they want to. They have complete control. That is the least invasive thing we're going to talk about today, is what your phone's already tracking. Now, stop what you do as a job. Think of this as an opportunity to put your mindset into the way of a marketer. How is that useful, knowing that of someone? Sir? If they uh, frequent, uh, I guess, a luxury aspirational mm -hmm. uh, you know, store or Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Yes. Anyone else? Yes? If you know where the fish are, that's where you're going to fish. Perfect. <laughs> Proximity marking, geo based marketing, we'll talk about a couple examples about that, how they get used as well. This is just partial amounts of data. Facebook, I kind of look at this presentation as shock and awe, happy thoughts, and then scary stuff. We're going to get to the scary stuff of what it can actually do. Okay. This I put in after that slide to make a point. It's not meant to be read. I just really want to point to this and say, this is how we see our customers, our guests. We categorize them into groups, okay? Um, this is actually taken from Marriott. I built this one with them. Uh, how we work on our transient, our groups, our big sources, and so forth, our sources and types of business. Um, I like to ask always the question, when was the last time somebody showed up at your front desk saying, hi, I'm your Smurf? <laughs> Unless we're so small and low. <laughs> but that's how we refer to our guests. Why do we do that? Why do we as an industry categorize our guests? Hmm? Better market to them, yes. If we can create a, sim a similarity to some, it's easier for us to identify them. But what does that do to the individuality of that person? It homogenizes them. Now we as humans tend to do that anyway. We go over and say, oh, you. You're this tall, this round, uh, this, this, and this, and so forth. And we categorize because we try to quickly try to understand how we're going to interact with that person. We do the same thing in business. We try to put them into groups of people that we understand so we can better identify what it is maybe to market to them or at least give them service. Remember, we're in the hospitality business. How can we be of service to them? So this is our way of identifying people. Now, as you know by your phone, what you just did beforehand, we're all different. Now, we may say, because of the proximity of all of us here and being in the city, there are a lot of similar places that we've all have been. But the pattern, the duration, and the reason are completely different to each individual person. Just as much as the categories of how we identify our guests are completely different from a corporate traveler to a transient traveler to a, a smart. Okay. This is how we look at everybody. We call it the funnel. This is, we, we, we try to acquire guests. We then talk to them before they get here to try to amplify their value proposition. While they're here, we try to go over and amplify their value proposition. And then when they leave, we try to remind them why we want to give them a value proposition the next time they come by. It is the most unfair way that we can treat guests because everything we do fits into these silos of interpretation. When really we know as guests, all of us are different. For myself, first time here, you don't know if I'm interested in the historical value of the place. I'm on a business trip for the place. I've never been to Hawaii for the place. There's so many different facets of my visit here that I would be of interest if I had the opportunity to, to get something from you to understand better what it is that I would want to know. Remember, you're the keeper of the information. So, I'll refer to this a few times after we get to take this slide down. Everything from here to here is you all. That's revenue management. You know, when they book, uh, prime window, when they book, when they stay, the length of stay, and the departure. This area over here is the part you don't deal with, and that is the discovery phase, the awareness, the top of the funnel to keep the, the colloquialism going. It seems odd that I tell you that marketing is forward-facing, yet in this diagram, it's on the back side of the timeline. Because in all honesty, what we're doing is determining, way from over here, how they get to here. We're that conduit of conversation. That's what marketing does. We're going to be very specific about data, how to use the data, and how the data has been used. So this isn't just, oh yeah, marketing helps us with it. We're actually going to talk about functionalities. Okay? Now, here's some Facebook examples. Anybody here of custom audiences, lookalike audiences? Raise your hand if you have. That's not good. Dan, I know you looked. <laughs> Dan, Dan, I had the pleasure of Dan. First off, Dan's been a 
how long have we known? I don't, I don't even have that in the years. Um, we've been on so many council groups together and so forth, but he was on our live show. We do a live show for HSMA every Friday. We have about 1,600 people, uh, 22 countries. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, we talk everything hospitality, digital marketing. I mean, this morning it was 5.30 in the morning for me, but we did one. It's a lot. It's a good show. Anyway, custom audiences. I digress. Um, custom audiences for Facebook, because we can't talk about all the social platforms. We're going to talk about the big, biggest one right now. Custom audiences is giving Facebook a list of emails, just emails, and asking Facebook, hey, Facebook, out of all these emails I just gave you, do you know any of them? And Facebook's going to come back and say, yeah, I know 50%, 80% of the list. Now, we don't know their individualities. The individuality of those emails disappear. What we do know about them is everything that Facebook knows about you. All aspects of you. We'll talk about some of the specifics. One is, four years ago, I made in a presentation a statement, because I actually built a filter in Facebook's app manager campaign, looking for a one-armed Hindu in Amish country looking for Tex-Mex restaurants. Seriously. And I had an audience in Facebook that they could identify a group of people that qualified under all those filters. Now, I can add to that that has a home in New York worth at least a million dollars, two daughters, one of which goes to Penn University and Cornell, has a BMW that's at least three years old, and a Mercedes that is given to his daughter that was recently bought for, that's two years old. And I still have an audience. That's crazy. I mean, it's spooky crazy, because Facebook, in addition to, you say for instance, oh, I don't put my birthday in there, or I give them a favor, or I don't give my real address. That's not where Facebook is, most of the data. Facebook gets their data from the friends that you keep, the things that you like, the things that you share, the collaborations you keep, in addition to all the data that you may or may not have given them, the pages that you follow. Oh, but quick question. Um, in the world of, do you guys still do blitzes? Your sales team go out and hit the bid, yeah? There's some other alternatives to that. We'll, we'll ch chat about that a little bit. Anyway, so customizes, and oh, Facebook's plugged into a lot of other data sources. Your medical records, not your individual who you are medical records, but what medical records you have in collaboration with all the other medical records. All the finance, what are people getting loans, buying homes, all that data is, they're connected and called partner groups with Facebook. And all that data is filterable data that you can identify and isolate exactly the type of clientele that you have, which is going back to a conversation we're gonna have about the power of your data, what you know about your guests coming into your hotel. Lookalike audiences, for anyone that's been around long enough, American Express used to offer a lookalike audience campaign. American Express would come to your hotel and say, hey look, for $40,000, we'll take everybody who uses American Express cards and we'll send them, we're not gonna give you the list, we're gonna send them whatever offer you wanna make, $40,000. Facebook can do it for free. Lookalike audiences are taking a custom audience and saying, hey Facebook, these are my guest lists. This is, this is people that have stayed with my, my hotel or my resort. And I've made a custom audience out of them, so you know whom they are and what they are. How many of people in, say, the continental United States, within 1% of being exactly the same type of person, I like to think we're individuals, and we are, but there's a lot of similarities too, but within 1% exactly match that list? In Facebook, in fact, say, oh, I have 4 million. I have 6 million. Now, think of the value of that lookalike audience. If they are within, say even up to 10%, similar to the people that have already enjoyed your product, and now you have all the other aspects of Facebook to filter, like your feeder markets, geography, demographics, income levels, propensities, interests, and say, I want to make these offers or these things in front of those people, people that have never had an opportunity to appreciate your product, but are very similar to the people that have. That's in Facebook. So, Couple examples. This one I tend to breeze over, but I'm going to make a very quick point to it. Um, a very luxury, a high luxury resort I had uh, wanted to do a summer membership, very expensive membership, and so they wanted to. Uh, they had a full membership all the time, and they wanted to offer a summer membership. So we couldn't sell to the people that already had memberships. They already spent a lot of money to be there, and instead we had to figure out how to sell a very expensive non-asset product to a group of people that should be just like the people that already had memberships. We ended up finding out. And this is where you talk about propensities. You, do, you don't look for people that have memberships elsewhere, although we did. You don't look at people that like certain things, although we did. We looked at the type of person that used those things. It turns out that people that drive BMWs tend to like this product. We made a lot of money off of them for a very little money expenditure. 
by using lookalike audiences. Identifying people that were similar to the people that were already using our product and using the propensity of their interest to determine what it is that would be of most interest for them. Revenue management problem, I'm gonna ask a question. I uh, had a hotel, 14 days out, lost 62% of their occupancy. The group canceled, unfortunately due to a tragedy. There was a nutrition clause, but they didn't want to push it because it was a repeat group that had been for years and it was a tragedy that caused the cancellation. So they swallowed the 62% occupancy loss. Revenue managers, what are my options? <laughs> Pissing off your entire comp set because you're about to go to the basement. <laughs> Great, you're gonna go over and drop rate hoping to get any residual demand inventory that's coming in. And of course, what happens to those who are already on the books? They buy down, you put money back on the table. Any other options? And believe me, we've had some great suggestions. Don't think that this is like, oh, this is a good thing. <laughs> other, what, what are some other creative ways you might approach this? Sincerely, it's a... It, it depends on your market. If it's a dry market versus wine market, there's different options. Right? Exactly right, yes, 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 yes. Now, obviously, not, dry market is a key element to this, and not everything about this will be applicable because you have different airlift windows than the one example I'm about to give. So what we did was we made custom audiences. First thing we did was everybody that was on our books already for the dates we lost the occupancy, we made a custom audience out of it. Took all those emails that we had through and Facebook. <laughs> then we took everybody within 150 mile radius. Again, not directly applicable to island life at this point, let's just say the island in context. Why 150 miles for those on the mainland side? Why would that be a relevant issue? Drive market, but more specifically, because you're in a 14 day window, you're below your flight window. Nobody's gonna travel necessarily across country in a flight 14 days out, unless truly as far as the very dramatic rate, which we weren't trying to do. We weren't trying to just destroy our rate. We were looking to replace revenue. And the other was, everybody that stayed the same time last year. Again, if they had the reason to stay last year, they might have the same reason to stay this year. Put all those together, but then what we did with the, uh, the audience that we were already on the books, we made it what was called a negative audience, meaning they were not about to see what we are about to offer. To, not that they couldn't find it in many other ways, but what we were doing advertising-wise, we didn't want them to see on Facebook. And we offered the group rate to the remaining audience. Sold out. Now, does that happen all the time? No, but that's why this example's in the presentation. It does happen. <laughs> <laughs> There's been other times where we're like, dang, that didn't work. Uh, <laughs> that one worked. <laughs> the idea is, it's not about volume of spend, it's not about volume of, of broadcast, it's about defining your conversion value more precisely by putting product in front of the right person at the right time with the right offer. And Vaughn is gonna expand on that conversation even farther later on this afternoon. But in purposes of, it goes back to that video presentation we just did, the right moment, you're putting what people were most interested in for the reasons that they personally had individually for the product that you're offering. Okay, a couple other examples very quickly. Uh, I had the pleasure of speaking at Focus right a few years back, and uh, I was living in Florida at the time, and I didn't want to fight the traffic, so I reached out to the hotel, which was the Western Dip, and uh, Hollywood, and asked if what the rate was for the room was $4.99 or something, which is quite high in Florida at that time that they had the conference. So I said, oh, well, you know, the company I was working with at the time had a hotel just up the road. Hopefully they're not sold out, because as you know, within your own hotel ownership, you can't displace revenue. Um, so I called him and said, hey, you guys sold out yet? Can I stay the night so I can make it a little easier on the presentation? And I said, well, yeah, we're down, I think we were in the high 50s, low 60% at the time for occupancy. I'm like, well, what about the conference down the road? And they're like, what conference? I'm like, you got to do the right? <laughs> anyway, so I asked, what is your rack rate right now? Not your bar, rack rate. It was $100 less than the rate, that, the best rate, bar rate I could get at the dip. So I put that ad on Facebook. I don't know if you can read it from the back of the room, but it says, attending focus right, enjoy four diamond service for almost $100 less, just five minutes up the reach from the conference. I made it fo uh, focused, filtered, to anybody that liked focus right, and that liked all the main sponsors of focus right. What we ended up doing was selling the place out for seven days and getting a few extra thousand people that now followed our Facebook page because we were driving to the page first before going to a landing page. We thought that, wow, that's lightning, right? We hit the right spot, right time, Every two years that Focus Right came back, anytime we wanted their business, we didn't, we just took it. That was something like that. We just focused on the people that were interested in coming to market. 
tale to be told, you can do this to any of your competitors. Um, there is a feature, going back to the location aspect of what we showed in the phone, that you can put an address in Facebook and say, hey, Facebook, I want to make a three mile, five mile, 10 mile, whatever radius you want from that address. And Facebook will say, great, what kind of you know, group are you interested in? People that live within that radius? People that live within 99 miles of the radius? Or people that don't live 99 miles within the radius? Well, obviously, we're in hotels. We want the people to visit. We want the people that are from beyond 99 miles. So now I can make ads that show up in people that are staying in my competitors or looking at my competitors. And I forgot to mention also with custom audiences, anybody that comes to your website, you can track who comes to what page they go to and make a custom audience of them. So if they went to your weddings page, all of a sudden they go back to Facebook, and we knew what they were looking for on the weddings page. And when they left, we said, hey, you know that beach wedding you were looking for at the XYZ Hotel Resort? We can offer this or we can do this for you, so forth, tailored to their Facebook page. Now, Facebook and social is not about hard sell, it's not about direct sell, it's about storytelling. You don't just boom, 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 tell people rate the date, rate the date all the time. What you're really doing is creating content and dialogue a slow, methodical process of storylines that bring them to the point of highest conversion at the time you know they're most interested. Going back to the revenue management versus digital marketing. Social isn't about, as much as I gave the example of, hey, two weeks out, we did this. It's about slow storytelling. When you know when your best optimal booking window is, you make sure that all the social content with the appropriate storylines all coalesce to those different business cycles that you have, whether it's event-driven, holiday-driven, your business cycle itself, you make sure that all of your social content apexes with your offer and availability at a time that the people are at the most optimum to want that product. Up until that time, you're talking about cool stuff. Things to do, proximity interests, uh, things like family adventure, soft adventure, off the beaten path, historical cultural. These are just topic lines that you keep in continuity with an editorial calendar to bring people up to the point where they're most interested in what you're having to say and then make the offer that you want them to know about. Last example, food and beverage example. Uh, this one is a restaurant that was in a small town in Florida. It was adjacent to, but not inclusive of the hotel. Went through a $35 million renovation. It was 30 years old on the beach. Beautiful property, but was losing market share on their Friday nights to be exact. Um, there was 71 other businesses that you could walk to that were their direct competitors. It was a very dense little village downtown thing. The currency of the, of the area was valet parking. The idea is once you part, that was your key to go everywhere else. So what we decided to do, this is old school marketing with new school techniques. I used to own restaurants, and if I, anytime I wanted to fill up a happy hour, this is before the internet, I realized that I needed the young single women to come into my restaurant that is the way the young single guys would follow. And they do. So <laughs> we also know that the young single girls don't want to buy their own drinks, so there's ways of making sure the guys know that kind of thing and they buy them drinks. So what we did was we made a filter, this was free, we did posting. We just said, hey, anybody that this is themselves female, age 24 to 34, we did it year by year by year, um, that were indicating that they were single, like live music, because we also had a live music component to the end of the evening. Um, we were gonna post at happy hour, and this was in a radius, three mile radius, or five mile, uh, for them to go over and show the post to our valet, and they get free valet parking. Now, the place had 150 parking spots, at five o'clock we posted because everybody's walking out the door from their work and they're looking to see what they're gonna do and what their friends are gonna do and they see this post and they shared it. At 5.45 we stopped the post because the parking was full. So then we said, well, we're gonna kick it back up at nine o'clock because music starts at 10, so we're gonna do the same thing again. Couldn't even offer parking spaces because everyone's having such a good time, they didn't go anywhere else because the guys had what they wanted, which was a room full of women. And, they, and the women had a room full of guys that were buying them drinks. It was a really good combination. Again, you think lightning in a bottle, but they really, in all honesty, anytime we wanted to do this, we thought our competitors would catch on sometime. And we just kept beating them up. Every time we wanted to steal their business, we'd isolate where they were, we'd see who was busy, and we'd target them and say, hey, show this, get a free drink. And you'd see people get out of the bar and walk down the street to go to our bar. Scalable, man. Useful, yes. Okay. Long term strategies. A little on the technology side, let me kick this part of the side up real quick. Google took away our use of keywords for organic a while ago. What I mean by organic was it used to be that you would build your website based on content used on what Google told you were words being used to find you. Of course, you wanted certain things to be found for you that you would want to use certain words for. So that's the keyword thing you always heard about. 
Well, they took that away. You still use it for pay, but you don't use it for organic. What they gave us in reply in return was attribution strings. Anybody familiar with the term attribution? Just attribution in general. In a nutshell, it is because of this, this happens. Because of this, this happens. And that's your attribution string. So what this is blurrily showing you is the categories of what the Google tells you between social, organic, paid services. What was the connection point that created the conversions you see over here? And they're nicely ranked as the most profitable one or the most revenue generating one and descending from there. Well, the nice part about all this is nowadays all of our paid campaigns are trackable, traceable, we know what it is that they interact with. And also our social campaigns, what they shared and what they liked and everything else. And our organic pages the same way. So with that knowledge, we look at this and say, well, wait a minute. If we know where and how all this stuff is interacting in a string, if we improve what they're connecting to, we can improve that conversion. In other words, focus it to the right moment, to the right people. So by changing what we're learning from these attribution strings, we can go from a 2.5% conversion, which means that 98 people that came to your website didn't buy you anything or didn't come from you, to now 97 people are willing to believe in you get three of them. But that 1% conversion isn't just a 1% increase in revenue. If you go, for math majors, from 2.5% conversion to 3.5, how much is that? Is it just 1%? It's 10%, 10 times, actually not 10%, 10 times. It's, it's algorithmic, it grows exponentially as each initial layer of teens and tens come on top of each other, it grows faster. Okay, so just by improving your conversion without spending more money, you make more money from it. This is a new insertion to my presentation in only the past week. And it's a caveat of being warned and careful. In our industry, and we all know about talking about trying to increase our direct channel contribution. I'm with you on the Yeah, kind of that's kind of in the world of direct channel versus OTAs or any other channels to it, you have a lot of vendors that are coming to you saying, hey, I can improve your direct channel conversion on your website. Let me put a plug in on your website that's going to improve the traffic that's coming to your website. Just like we talked about, went from 2.5 to 3.5. We're going to improve your website's conversion, whether it's an incentive offer, whether it's one of those dang pop-ups or overlays or all the other stuff that goes on. They're plugging this into your website, but they're not sharing with you and what's falling between the cracks between being a revenue manager, a marketer, an IT person, an accounting person, or operations is that these things put programs onto your website and hijack your traffic account. So in other words, what used to be your organic direct channel, people came to your website because they were looking for you, these plugins have these conditions like this. They say, oh, well, as soon as they mouse closer to the browser, we're going to pop up. Or if uh, you hit the command key, we're going to pop up. What it does do, and where the golden arrows point at, is that it stops the tracking of the session that brought them originally and gives them credit for it. And then you pay them the commission that you already had. This is not as obscure of a thought. Let me give you an example. Well, this is an example of the distortion of it. It's an example of what actually happens on websites. This is this hotel. I have a little plugin, and it's written a little plug out ghostly on Chrome that tells you, tells me, how many things are actively tracking on the website. And that is the pixels and the tracking that the Google Analytics and everything. There is 36 trackers on this website. I can guarantee you the property does not get all the data from all 36. And I can guarantee you I don't know what probably a third of those are, and I work in the space. There are so many layers on top of layers. Now, this isn't the brand issue. This isn't this hotel issue. This is an example I show each and every time we go to each and every hotel, whether it be independent or whether it be branded. There's layers upon layers of tracking that aren't known to you because in the small, the small print of uh, the programs, the plugins, and so forth, is the ability to garner data. And that data is just as valuable as the money that comes from your website, especially if you have a working relationship with some of these that you pay them for supposedly the business that they're improving or driving. It's just a cautionary tale. All right. One more example of the combination between social and organic. This, again, hard to read from the distance, is two different lines graphed a timeline. This is over a course of one year. The blue line on the top 
There's a posting on Facebook about Halloween. The little orange squiggly line on the bottom is the organic tracking of that page that's on the website associated with that post, which means to say every time you do a post in Facebook, it has to, it should go somewhere. Don't simply rely upon posting something with a book link. Um, okay, this may be a little slightly off to the right. In the dating world, uh, you don't walk up to somebody and try to get to the good relationship aspect right off the bat. You don't walk up to somebody and say, hi, you don't know me, but would you like to come home? <laughs> That's what you put a good aspect. <laughs> Same true with your websites. I go to your website and the first thing that pops up is buy this. Whoa, I'm just looking right now. Why are you, you know, these pop-ups, these sliders, all this stuff, buy, buy, buy. I don't know enough about you yet. I mean, you had my first drink, what are you talking about? <laughs> Why do it in your business life? 30 minutes? Well, all right, hey, we're at a good page right now. This is good. All right, so say two of this. So we had a post for Halloween, that's the one spike. Now afterwards, you see it's pretty much flatlined. Nothing else happened with that post on Facebook. But you see the little gold lines, kind of got a little squiggly, squiggly, squiggly thing going on. Well, Google Analytics tracked, there's a neat way of doing this, in Google, it'll tell you the page value, if you set it up correctly, that each page contributed to the revenue that your website generated. So this page, even after the post disappeared for what it was made for, continued to be used by Google for something. Whether it was because it got indexed and tracked and people looking for Halloween stuff, whatever it was. But over the course of the year, that one post for one specialty event generated an additional $40,000 of contributed revenue simply because it was being used for organic value by Google. And that page gave you residual value long, before, long after that one post that it was connected to. So there's always that perennial, everything on the internet stays on the internet. Okay, cool stuff. Anybody use Tableau? Tableau, wicked cool program. In Tableau, I made, first off, in your website, everything is trackable. Everything is trackable. Okay, heat maps, everything. There's tons of software I can show you that just does some really cool stuff. But there's a thing called Google Tag Manager. And what that does is it stuffs all that tracking code stuff into one code so that it doesn't slow down your website. Well, in Tableau, I wanted to track when they put the little dates in the windows, when they're interested, they come to your website and they put the little dates in is when they're interested. Well, I'm also tracking where they're at when they did that. So if they were in Philadelphia and they looked for the third week of March, I knew that. So what I did was I put it all together in Tableau and I made a little slider way up in the right you can't see. And it answers the question that most revenue managers ask. I need business on the third week of March. I don't know if you asked that exact question, but anyway. So you put a little slider over to that week in March. And what it did show me was all the markets that were looking for those dates and the days ahead that they were doing it. So in other words, in Denver, it was 75 days ahead of the dates that I moved the slider onto. So I had a lead time of 75 days. Remember that one example I had of the squiggly line of the discovery period? That's the discovery period. This is we don't know why they looked, although we do eventually, but we know that they did. They came to the site and they looked for those dates and they were located in Denver. Again, stopping revenue management, going to the marketing site, how can that help me? Knowing where they are and what they're interested in. I'm sorry, say again. Right. Right. Instead of shooting you across the entire country, I'm focused on Denver. Because I know 75 days ahead of those dates, there's a likelihood that they're interested in staying because they looked already. Now, revenue management, put that back at back on. You know the rate of that source of business. You know that people in Denver are below your acceptable rate threshold right now. So revenue management is how much unitable business do you want? How much base business do you want? Maybe it's not Denver. Maybe Denver's not a bad idea if I wanted that rate, but really maybe there's another market that might be a better rate for me that I would want more business from. So what this is, same data, but now I categorize it according to its revenue contribution. And 80% of total revenue for the data, your dates that you're looking for, whatever uh, markets this is top 20 only because it went up to 20, based on the highest revenue contribution by that geographic location. Also in there is your ADR. 
your average cost of service, which we'll get to, occupancy, and so forth. So now I can say, well, I want business from New York because that rate is the rate I want, or it's closer to the rate I'm willing to accept right now for building based business. Or maybe that's my peak rate because I'm compressing. Okay? Out of that, it also tells me what channel produced that revenue for that market. Now here it's cumulative to the 20, but if this was dynamic, I can select the market and this high chart will shift to what component generated that revenue. Now, in that component, say paid ads, I know that my current conversion is say 2.5%, and my cost per click, which means when somebody actively acts on my ad, is say a dollar. I can now forecast without much of most revenue management tools that you're currently using, by that measure, how much money do I need to spend on what channel, in what market, at what rate, at what time, to generate what options? I just forecast. And I didn't use anything but the rate that you're interested in getting. Now add that layer to what you already know, the historical, the trend, the compressions, and all the other things, and now you have the ability to combine marketing knowledge so now, as revenue managers, you can guide marketers to say, look, guys, because you know, digital marketers, all they do is come up to you and ask for package offers and discounts, right? <laughs> I need you to focus on the following market, and I need you to spend money to pay, specifically Google, a little bit of Bing, and I'm expecting on the conversion rates and the dollar rates, if I give you $1,500, you're going to give me $15,000, and you're going to give my occupancy for the third week of March, a 10 point occupancy boost. The math and the data are already yours. It's already built. Now, Brand has a limited way of giving you some of the data. We've asked the right questions to the right brand people. You can't get the specifics needed to build the same thing. This is a free example of just simple data usage with more complex ideas. Large scale resort was getting into a business cycle that was negative to what they were used to. They're going down, they used to go up. So what we do is we take all our old data and say, where do we get business from? Let's just take all the zip codes and make a heat map. This is called Google Fusion, it's free. We shoved all the zip codes in by the volume that they represented. Meaning if there's 100 people in one zip code, 500 people in another zip code. We shoved it all in. Now this is static, but you have the ability to zoom down to the zip code. Data that's out there, census information. You can look at income levels based on zip code. Great. Because we figured, hey, this is an expensive resort to go to, so it's got to be a correlation to the location. So what we did was we created an axis. We said, northern axis is revenues that they've generated, horizontal axis is their income compensated. Quadrant system. Obviously, in the upper right quadrant, they were not only generating the revenue that we were hoping for, but the income propensity to, generate, to do so. Okay, they, they were doing good for us. Anyone in the lower quadrant had the income to generate revenue for us, but they weren't generating the revenue. This was historical data. This isn't propensity of new markets or anything. This was places we're already getting business from. So we did snail mail. We just, no offer, no discount. Hey, don't, worry, don't forget about us. Remind you about us. Remember how much fun you had with us? They sent a snail mail. 30% increase in 30 days, just simply by identifying the market you're already getting business from, but reminding them that there was a value problem. I don't know if anyone has pulled this before, but I'm sure you have. This is your <laughs> arrivals list. What it is is very blurry, but if anybody gets some OTAs, this is not negative to OTAs. You'll notice you get these ghost emails. Not much good for custom audiences or anything. Now, there are some real emails in there, and they're always good to glean and add as a custom audience on Facebook. But you get a lot of emails from OTAs that you cannot use. So is this useless data? You have your guest's full name, you have the confirmation numbers. You have their creation date, which is book arrival date, rate code. This is just Jim issue. Anything useful about that? What possible use could we have about having rate codes, names, promotion rate codes, uh, see arrival dates, confirmation numbers? If you have promotions. Say again, I'm sorry, we'll do both. If you have promotions, you can use the rate codes to track. Boom. That's just two sources of data off this list. What else? You match the, uh, the uh, iPhone location. You can, you can, by, can the confirmation when you pull it into your, your PMS system, all any relevant data to them that you have pulls up, especially the previous guest. 
Now, OTAs, we always want to keep, if they drive first level business, first time business, that's what we really want to use them for. It's a shame for us to let OTAs drive second time business, because that means we missed our opportunity when the guest came the first time. But this allows us to say, hey, by confirmation of whatever other information do we know about these people, that's one, just one column on its own, including location. Rate code, rate code according to where they are. Take the zip codes out of the confirmation numbers and where's that correlation? What rate seems to be favoring certain for certain feeder markets? Does that match to what you think your feeder markets are generating? So there's data everywhere. That's the example of this one. It's just there's data everywhere to use. Real quick, I want to make four statements. You may not be able to play all the videos, but websites will be a thing of the past. The search box will go away. AI will control your market, which is artificial intelligence. And video will become your only voice. They look a little bit more shopping off. Okay, dynamic websites. I'm going to skip this video because it's basically I'm a sci-fi buff again. This is Avengers and not Avengers, but uh, X-Men. And uh, the idea was the bridge that builds itself. Dynamic websites are there are brands right now, brands that you work for right now that are building non-websites. Websites are construct of what we think we can be anticipating the guest needs. We bring them to a main page, we give them a Pandora's box of things to click and where to go and what to do, because we don't know what the heck they're there for. Instead now, dynamic sites are, we know enough about your usability, aka like the phone example, okay, that we see within like Gmail, because you do Gmail ads, when you, you know, you ever, if anybody has Gmail and they get a flight reservation, you can actually confirm it and check in and everything through Gmail. You can do that right now with your membership rewards programs in your hotels. You can actually have it where they can identify themselves as a member and they can correspond with your property as a brand. It's one of the better benefits of being a brand hotel. And you can actually put that into your Gmail. Anyway, they know enough about you that I'm talking to Dan, and Dan, I'm gonna meet you for business in New York on the 24th, and when I go to an XYZ branded hotel that's building this, all of a sudden the images, the content, and the offers are all about business travel. Now, maybe they got it wrong, and maybe I was gonna bring my family with me or something, and I click on another navigation because you give them options, and all of a sudden the images and the content change to include what it is that you're clicking on. But the other main component of that conversation is the dynamic content, dynamic ads, okay? Now, we're gonna breeze through a couple of these other points real quick. Bots and APIs are what's driving all this. Uh, we talked about Echo today. Um, this is 30, it's 15. <laughs> and this is, get out of there. <laughs> I told them they need to put one of those zappy dog colors on me, so it's like, you know, I'm done. Um, okay, Amazon, when it launched, it could do 16 things. 16 things. It's over 16,000 two years later. 16,000 things you can do with Amazon Echo. Everybody's in this space right now, including Microsoft. Example of Microsoft, the Cortana, other than trying to get into cars, they're getting into hotel rooms. This is a little hard to read, but you'll see it in the slide deck later if you want to play it back. All the functionalities are going on with Marriott and Hilton right now are, are battling over whether they want to use Siri or they want to use Google in the rooms. Huge legal issues with that. As you can see in some of the news precasts, when some people go over and they're trying to subpoena the data because Amazon always listens, Google always listens, Siri always listens, and that is usable content. Who owns that content? If somebody's in your hotel room, would you tell your hotel guests, oh, by the way, there's webcams for your security? Yeah, no. <laughs> Not in the room, thank you. Well, that's what happens on that. If you put an echo in somebody's room thinking you're being beneficial with the guest experience, who owns that content? Wonder if something happened and that data got used, and all of a sudden you say, whoa, whoa, what happened to my hotel room? I rented that space. What means you can use that content off of that? There's rules yet to be written for stuff that's already in our daily lives. Okay. Search box will go away. Again, cute video for those who like Star Trek. Basically, computers, we talk to them now. We talk to inanimate objects. Google used to have the business model of do no evil. It's kind of a fun thing for them to say. Oh, we're building a business that's uh, do no evil. You know what their new version of their business model is? Ultimate personal assistant. Think about this. They give us search engine result pages, which is we think this is the most relevant thing that you're looking for, and here's a few other choices. Well, now you're talking to Amazon, and you're talking to Google Assistant, you're talking to Siri, you're talking to Cortana. You don't want, oh, we think it might be this, and it might be that too, and maybe it's this, and no. They want you to be able to have the answer to the question you have. One question, one answer. Ultimate assistant. Problem is, if you don't have the right content, if you're not representing who you are or what you are, your relevance, may mean that you're not that one answer. 
All of a sudden, we're a commodity. We could be right next door to the hotel that gets the business because they optimized their opportunity for being relevant, and you didn't. That's how critical this is. Okay, uh, example of Alexa, which is scary in itself. Google Assistant example. <laughs> This one I'll explain very quickly because I don't want to play the video because it's actually scary. This is a uh, software, the people, that, the people that built Siri, it used to be an app for Apple. Well, Apple ate them up, metaphorically. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so they kept on building. They made a software called Viv, V-I-V. And this is like Skynet out of the Terminator movie, in movie reference. Um, it writes its own program. So you could ask questions like, is it warmer this Thursday than it was last Thursday at the Golden Gate Bridge? And if and wow, Siri would be like, we have no idea what you're talking about. This will write a program to answer that question in less than 10 milliseconds. And then use it the next time it needs to build something similar to it. Very spooky. Anyway, uh, Samsung bought them and they disappeared. So you know it's going to come somewhere. Okay, meta search, very quickly. We're going to skip the answering questions, which is people often think meta search is really about the representation of TripAdvisor, Kayak. Travago, Skyscanner, Quivo, so forth and so on. Yes, it is, but it's the scary connection of what it is in its entirety, which I really want to get to. And this is what I want to get to. Anybody here have done any guys for travel? Facebook's Dynamic Guys for Travel. I had the privilege of being in Shanghai back and forth a few times with a company that was building dynamic content relationship, Derby Soft, and they were working with Facebook. Really weird to see the room that everybody's way smarter than you, but they keep looking to you like you have an answer they don't have. And it's like Facebook's over there, these guys are here, like, the engineers could build anything that you ask them, and Facebook and the market didn't know what to ask. So I get to talk to both of them. What this is, every arrow that you see on this ad is dynamic content. What's dynamic content? Uh, anybody see an ad that says, rates starting at 109, and then you click it, and there's not a 109 rate inside. <laughs> and what does it do? It just passes you off, and you're like, you don't buy. That's a static ad. It goes from advertising to targeting to retargeting to, to programmatic, programmatic to AI, to behavioral, behavioral to AI, artificial intelligence. This is the AI world. Because of whom you are and what you are known, remember that Facebook discussion we had? Well, Google's just the same as, and so are a lot of other flat platforms. All of this, it knows you're a member. It knows how much inventory in real time is available. The rate that is in real time valuable to you or offered by. What the ratings are that you're interested in, which we don't have the blessing of going through the entire content of rate as it relates to your, your, your revenue generation, but know there is a very direct correlation to poor revenue reviews means less to no conversions. All of this information is built to your individual benefit. Remember that blue chart we are talking about Smurfs? That goes away. This is all about your individual, what they know about you as an individual. Everything about this, the brand that you like, the ideas that you like, the location that you like, the rates that you like, the inventory, what you remember, everything is put together for you, and when you click on it, that rate and availability is there. This video, I hope you do go to see the slide deck. This is Lucy. Everybody here, Watson? IBM's Watson? This is his sister, Lucy. And Lucy, uh, Lucy is marketing Watson. You can shove everything at it you want, and then ask the question, I need business on March 3rd, and we'll tell you exactly what you need to do, on what platform and how to do it, how much to spend, <coughs> what rate you should offer, everything. It actually is artificial intelligence for marketing. Again, if we don't merge the revenue management marketing model together, these automations will answer a lot of the questions before we get the chance to. Okay, video-wise. We're gonna skip the first three a little bit because there really is, for instance, we know about that. That was the introduction to the augmented world, the, the, uh, the oh, excuse me. <laughs> I just, Pokemon, I hate it. Uh, <laughs> virtual reality. Augmented reality is actually the one that's going to happen best. We're done? We're good. Oh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. VR. VR is not going to be as important to us. VR, in the sense of, I'll give you an example, and this is really related to something I want to bring up to being from where you are, what you are to deal with. My clients in Australia. Same aspirational travel that you all face in getting people here during certain time cycles of their life. Australia, as you know, has similar, in that sense, that usually it's the young 
and the backpacking, and then the old and the empty nesters. And there's a very big gap in between them because of the affordability of getting there from the United States. So what we want to do is a, uh, improve the aspirational travel. So we tracked to this hotel website from two major freedom markets, San Francisco and Los Angeles, people that were absolutely positively not buying. And we did this through a software that tracked uh, when they came to the website, how many times they went to the uh, combinations page, how many times they went to the book page, the picture page, the what to do page, and they never, ever, ever, ever pulled the trigger. And we offered them incentives, everything we could, and then more. So what we did was, when I was down there, I went over to my little 360 camera, which is back there. Oh, you'll see me run around with it today, too, because I always do a 360 shot of the group and stuff, video-wise. And went over and did five videos. Uh, down by the uh, Opera House, over on top of the bridge, uh, Toronto Zoo, downtown Westfield. Uh, anyway, we put them on a, uh, a closed YouTube website, and we took 100 people out of these two markets that absolutely positively didn't buy anything, and we sent them in snail mail, little Google cardboards, those little things you put on your face, you put your phone in, and you can look around. They're like three bucks each. Put a QR code on it says, here, scan this. We know you want to come to Australia. Let's show you why. They scanned it, put the app on their phone, then scanned the other QR code to go to the videos, and they selected the videos. And put the earbuds in, and we looked around, and we had the concierge going, hey, welcome to such a video. Anyway, out of the 100 people that got this, 64 of them booked. To scale, no. I mean, unless you want to send out a few thousand of these things and so forth. But the idea of video's usage as a medium of explaining what you're offering is profound. Okay? And it's just not in the recorded version of all this. That's the little camera I have. Facebook Live. There's good, there's bad, there's never just one side to these things. Facebook Live is a massive opportunity for you to share the experiences that you talk about and share about in content so often. I have things from chefs who show very quickly in a casual way how they're building the dinner special, and they sell out. I have bartenders who go over and show the flavored drink that they're offering that night and have a busy bar. I have really motivated and, and happy people showing meeting spaces. We used to have, and this goes beyond Facebook Live, where every time we set a meeting room, especially for smart business, they stand in the same location room and did a 360 Google picture, and it's free. And what we do is we bring the bride in and the bride's mom for a day. Ta-da, here's your room. This is what it's going to look like. We purposely left it miserable. You know, stacked up tables, chairs stacked. All this and we're like, what, what? Hold on. And we put the goggles on. And they can stand in one location and say, now look at your room. And the colors that they wanted, the chair covers they wanted, the centerpieces they wanted, because we kept taking pictures of all the things that we did when we had it set and ready. Now they're staying in the middle of their room. And they see the room the way it will look when you set it up. It's a huge pile. And it's free. You can do that whenever you like. And the nice part about the Google stuff is, as you make them, it puts it on Google Maps. The one I did by the uh, Opera House as an example, almost half a million people stood where I stood looking at the picture I took. It's just crazy thing, but anyway. Um, okay, so that's the video. That's the link. Um, we can share it again later if you want to for it. What I really want to get to is, who has the problem? What problem do you have? We can try to like, hammer a few minutes out. There's got to be a problem. Not everybody's 100% occupancy all the time. They're perfect in your What problem do you have? Is it people coming to market, more inventory to market, competitive set change, under renovation, uh, brand saturation? Yes. Changing. Uh... So you're, you you would like to see, is there a way for us to solve um, going from usually historically having a longer 90-day book window to a 70-day book, book window, that that loss is there? Correct. Okay. Branded or unbranded hotel? Okay. Um, any access to analytics of who's looking at your site that you have pulled so far in the sense of who is visiting your site? Yes. Okay. And any information about their booking um, interest, like when they come to your site, are they saying that there's people looking for these certain dates versus these certain dates? Any data from I don't know which brand, so I, I don't want to be too specific about asking that. Uh, I would have to research that. Okay. Yeah. If possible, if you can determine what brands to look for, because there's two windows you're always looking at when you're looking at your data, especially from analytics or websites. It's your short-term booking window, what they're looking for and why. 
usually rate driven, and then long term, what are they looking at aspirationally or in long term sense, which I think is more directed to what you're asking. First thing is, being from the island, uh, the data that you're getting from the airlift. Are you correlating the increase or decrease in the lift capacities to anything associated with your booking window diminishment or increase? Yeah. Okay. Are you looking at any of the rate changes that are going on with airlift as to opportunities within that same window of booking that you're going to change? Yes. Is there a correlation between a decrease in rate and an increase in interest or window free? So if the rate of the airline goes down for whatever reason, or airlines in general, you see a difference in demand window of interest, whether it be 90 or 70 days. Uh, a lot of similar, similar. Okay, so there's a bit of a pair about going on with both of those. Okay, any aspect, have you looked historically at, and just to take a slice of time, and not to just look at the whole elephant and try to take a bite, but look at a smaller portion of it. Is there a particular window that you would find valuable to focus on that says, where are my feeder markets for this particular market? Have you done that? No. Possibility, and this goes back to one of the clients I have in New York, they have a lot of international travel to them from South America. There seems to be an opportunistic window, one associated with rate lift, according to the airline lift. The other is, uh, when it comes to that particular geo source of market, it falls into a well of localized activity. They actually get more business when there's less to do locally. And the only way we found that out was isolating the individual feeder market and saying this town, Buenos Aires versus whatever, had less to do during that week span or that month span that we're interested in wondering what we can do. The other is, in your, in your value propositions, and this goes back to your feeder market questions. In your value propositions, are you just simply broadcasting rate and date, or are you isolating individual opportunity to a, uh, to a feeder market? Are you advanced in the marketing to go down to a feeder market? Might be another possibility to do that, where you guys, just so that I'm not trying to assume anything, San Francisco, Los Angeles, what's another hub airport that comes to Seattle. Seattle comes out, who else? Is Denver any business for that? Is anyone hub for business in Denver? I know, I know right now, like I'm going back to Dallas, and there is a little bit of Dallas, but I don't think it has any real strong impact right now. Anybody else that's developing more directly across to you that's making any difference? My best, data, and this goes back to finding data, those hubs are difficult to identify because they're hubs, they're not really from that market, they're just passing through that market. So really what you look at is not, and we did this for the Aruba and so forth, rather than looking at just the, the, the source airline or the source hub that they're coming from, because San Francisco and Los Angeles is not your, your total market, it's a portion of the market. So looking at what lift goes in that market from where they're feeding, because every, every hub has cyclic uh, uh, lift going to it from other hub destinations. And they, they I mean, why invent, reinvent the wheel? Airlines are very smart about how they optimize their use of mechanical and everything. So they know when they need to add additional aircraft on certain routes from certain markets. There is a way to find out first, just, and this is as simple as going to the, the, the airport itself and looking at the airlines that are feeding it, then looking at their flight schedules, and then taking those cities and seeing when they announce that there's more flight carriers, which is historical news you can do in Google. And when you see them having lift from certain smaller markets, that gives you a feed start. Because those people are more likely to be the window that you want because they have to plan longer than those who are more uh, focused on direct connect or on short-term opportunities, which is what you're trying to correct for. You want to stretch that, that window up. Unfortunately, we're done. Uh, um, <laughs> sorry. About that. Uh, there's something while we're doing this. I'm going to show you something else while we're talking. Um, there is a way. You're never going to stretch the book window. You're going to look for business that may not have looked at you longer out. Because those who are already down to 70 days will continue to, to do that. And they'll continue to get shorter. What you need to do is look for the next layer out that is going to take the time to uh, my key, easy, to uh, want to go through that effort and book longer because they have more planning to do to get to you. And that also goes back to the aspirational component of is it demographically profiled? Is it an older group or a younger group that needs that lead time? And whether it's family or not family, and what's the purpose of their actual visit? Is it family, you know, again, family venture, soft adventure, uh, senior, so forth and so on. These are some things I want you to be aware of just for the purpose of there's ad, these are little programs that you can get. This one's a pay for, but this is free to use right now. It's called SERPSTAT. If you ever want to know what your competitors are doing, how you're doing, it shows you lots of free stuff. Another one is Spy Fu. And the reason why I point all these out is because what your competitors are doing are just like you do a SWOT analysis for your revenue management. You have to identify what your competitors are doing to know best how to either steal what they're doing well and use it for your own, or how to combat what they're amplifying for themselves 
it might be a weakness for you. And this is uh, Spy Fu, and I put the website of the hotel here, not because they did anything bad or right, but just to show you the diversity of information that they point out for free. I mean, there's a lot of free stuff. And AdWord history, the string of how they get used, and that's just data. That's stuff that you can look at or your marketer can work with you on to determine what you should be doing with it. And that is well beyond my time, I guess. No, it wasn't well beyond my time, It was so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. There's a reason why we have to do our 30 minutes half time because we could all listen to them all day, right? And you just want to take him, put him in your pocket for like a month. Yes, I always say that. Every dinner I have with him, I learn something new about him personally and also some cool new gadget, widget, tool, something to search. So, Lauren, thank you so much. I did want to mention um, that we had a second presenter in this bridging portion of our um, presentation this round of Rocket, and that was Victoria Edwards with Profit Cloud, who was doing a follow-up on Lauren's presentation. Unfortunately, she had to fly out of San Diego last night or yesterday um, home to a family emergency, but I wanted to let you all know that her presentation deck will be included in your follow-up. And I forgot to mention that at the top. So I love all your photos that you're taking right now. I do want to let you know that you will have the follow-up. You will have all the presentation decks with all the data and all the information um, sent to you either, uh, let's see, we're on Friday, so early next week. So we're going to take a 15-minute break now. Um, so we can be back in the room by 2.45. We'll get started with our last two sessions from Bonnie Buckeister. Then on to uh, some networking. Thank you. I got to volume back up on that. Okay. Well, they're here, so they're here to help us. So let's see if we can. Test sound. Let's make sure that's back in. Let's not do that one because that one's really loud. Oh, actually, I've got two that one. <laughs> Thank you. 
All the way down. Oh. You did it quick, I think. So I told you to talk about it. You found that I turned your volume down because when I want to play, I hear when you know play, it goes, you know. So I turned down the volume in the back. Oh, there you go. That was me. Sorry. <laughs> I was about to go back and turn it back up, but no, we're here, so I was like, okay. Just... Yeah. Should we try it? Let's try it. Yeah. Is this showing up here? 